Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim Deuteronomy 6.4, the cornerstone of our faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Vayed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign of your, on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first. V'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I was thinking about that, that verse. Yeshua said the second command is like the first. And sometimes people might think, well, in the Ten Commandments, that's not the second command. But it's the second command in its effectiveness, in its power. And if you look at the commands that are there in the Ten Commandments, they all relate to community relationship. They all relate to interacting with others. And so this is, according to Yeshua, the second of the two important commands. Everything else rests on that. So we're going to worship the Lord, and we're going we're gonna to do some songs we haven't done for a while, but it, it really goes along with what we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, when you go through challenging periods and times, it can get you down. But God commands us to rise, rise up from the place that you've fallen. He's always bringing us back to restore us. And so this is called Rise, Rise Up. Rise, rise up from the place that you've fallen. Rise, rise up to you have been calling. Rise, rise up. I'm here now restoring. Rise, rise up. Return to me. Rise, rise up from the place that you've fallen. Rise, rise up. To you I've been calling, rise, rise up, I'm here now restoring, rise, rise up, and return to me. You wandered so far away, you missed the mark and went astray, but my heart reaches out to you still. Oh, you drifted so far away, and on your own you went astray. But saving your life is my biggest thrill. 
And restoring your life is at the heart of my will. Cause redeeming your life is not some new fancy frill. But restoring your life is at the heart and core of my will. It's the very core of my will. And I am here with you still. Place that you fall in, rise, rise up. rise up. To you, I'm still calling. Rise, rise up, rise up. I'm here now, restoring. Rise, rise up, return to me. Rise, rise up. From the place that you fall in, rise, rise up. To you, I'm still calling. Rise, rise up. I'm here now restoring Rise, rise up, return to me Return to me. Oh, yes, rise, rise up and return now to me. Praise the Lord. Baruch Hashem. God wants us to rise up. He wants us to not fear the day, not worry about the hours by night. <laughs> he doesn't want us to fear any of those things, but He wants us to. Face the darkness, face the things that are there, and press in forward to what God is doing in our life. We press on through the night because God has victory at the other end for us, and he makes us to shine like the noonday. Darkness and things we don't yet know Still into the night With all of our might we now go Oh, into the night With darkness and fear all around And into the night Uncertain of what will be found Oh, yes, and into the night Your unfiltered light will abound and with the light of your power and grace And in the light that shines from your face Oh, into the night Filled with your light we go Yes, into the night Filled with your light we now go And the darkness has to flee As your light sets people free And everyone will shine so bright Noonday in the night, just like noonday in the night. We go to set the captives free, open the eyes that cannot see, to bring about what soon must be. Like noonday in the night, we shine like noonday in the night. No matter what the challenge is, we need to step forward and follow what the Lord is leading us to do. Not worry about all the other voices that are out there and set captives free. We go to set the captives free. Open the eyes that cannot see. To bring about what soon must be. Like noonday in the night. It's like noonday in the night. shine so bright like noonday in the night just like noonday in the 
night Oh yes, and into the night Restored by your light We now go Praise the Lord. I tell you, no matter what the challenge is, and we're going to be talking about some of these things going on today, the challenges that are out there, but we cannot flinch. We need to look into the face of Messiah. We need to look into the heart of God and allow him to build us up no matter what difficulties we may go through. And sometimes we ruminate over all these different things that are going on. What are people going to say? What's going to happen? What am I going to do? What am I going to be? What is it? All this stuff going on. And we need to be able to learn how to praise the Lord with praise, honor, and glory and allow him to just simply fill us with his presence. God inhabits the praises of his people. If you want God to be in every situation you find yourself and you want him to be close, learn how to praise him. Learn how to worship him. And God's presence will be there. Praise, honor, and glory. When I think about what I think I want to be, and I think too much of what others think of me, when I think about it, then I just stop and sing. Praise, honor, and glory. Praise, honor, and glory. Praise, honor, and glory. Belong to you, only to you. And I sing praise, honor, and glory. Praise, honor, and glory. And deeply humbled, I just sing praise, honor, and glory, praise, honor, and glory, praise, honor, and glory, belong to you, only to you. I just sing praise, honor, and glory, praise, honor, and glory, praise, honor, and glory. Think about how pride can capture me, and I think about how dark my heart can be, and I think about how you came and rescued me, and I just have to sing, I must sing. Praise, honor, and glory. Praise, honor, and glory. our voice and sing praise, honor, and
praise the name of the Lord. He deserves all the praise, honor, and glory, doesn't he? Because there is none like him. He is just an amazing creator. <laughs> I mean, that's an understatement, isn't it? Yes. Shabbat shalom. Sabbath peace to you. Welcome to Beth Zion. We're glad you're here today with us. And our calling as a congregation continues to be declaring Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey and to the world for that matter, sharing the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes so that we can understand the context of what Yeshua spoke about and did and how consistent it was with all of the Torah, with all of the scriptures, with all that God laid out for us. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And we want to be in a position to declare the truth as laid out in the scriptures, as laid out in the word of God, and be able to be sensitive to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to lead us and guide us into all truth and to take his word. You know, he makes his word come alive in us. And when he makes that word come alive in us, we're able to declare it with power and authority because it doesn't come from our own opinion, but from what God's word says and what God's heart is towards all people to bring people back and return them to himself. And so we are grateful for that opportunity to share this truth with people. It's a Jewish faith for the whole world. So we should probably follow through and understand the fullness of the truth as we share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. Avinu Makeno, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to come to your word. We ask you to open up our hearts to be able to hear what your Ruach, what your spirit would say to us as we come into your presence. We ask you to bless this time together and open your word to us and the applications that are there for us. In Yeshua's name. Amen. In a very interesting portion this week, it's from Leviticus 25, verse 1, beginning there. And it's called Bahar. It's on the mount or on mount. And it is from the place where it says that Hashem spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. Or some people pronounce it Sinai, but in Hebrew, Sinai. He said, tell the people of Israel, when you enter the land I am giving you, the land itself is to observe a Shabbat rest for Hashem. And it's kind of interesting because we think of Shabbat as a day of rest for us. But there is actually reference in here to some very interesting elements that for the most part have not been followed by our people. There's no significant place that we can find in the scripture where people actually observed and did the seven years, the Shemitah, or the Yovel, which is brought up in here, the Jubilee, 50th year, the year of Jubilee. But there's some very interesting parts to what it describes as happening here. And what I have as my, you see the, the overhead, it says the cure for dystopia. And everybody says, well, not everybody. So what is dystopia? It's not a disease. This is not like, I guess it is a disease of sorts. But it's not like these things with the commercials, the medical commercials, where they say, if you suffer from dystopia, this medication will help you. It may cause death, blindness, deafness, stroke, heart attack, sudden death. If you get depressed and are suicidal, talk to your doctor. But ask him if this is right for you. And one of the dark things about dystopia is, and I thought about this recently, because we're looking at the Yovel, the Jubilee. People get into difficult places, and really this was the, the social network that was able to help people get back on their feet again. Uh, sometimes people will talk about, they, were, they say, well, you believe in slavery, they're gonna sell themselves into slavery. It was their social network system to bring back and restore people. And the ownership of property, which this goes into in the beginning of this, the ownership of property 
was not based on how many malls you could put up or condominiums or anything like that, but how much in the way of crops can be produced in the land. That is what gave it its value. It was an agricultural society. And there was something about the inheritance that we received from the Lord, the land that was given to each of our people, and that it was to stay within the family. And if somebody came on hard times, they could sell their property. But at the year of Yovel, the year of Jubilee, it would all be restored back again. And the value of the property was based on how many crops would come out of the fields. So when somebody bought the property, it was based on what productivity could happen from that field. And it would restore back again to them. That There were some other things in here that I thought were interesting. Um, that they had rules for selling property. You couldn't sell it to anybody, and you couldn't just simply, but because it would come back again. So it had to stay within the family. And it says in verse 13, in this year of Yovel, every one of you is to return to the land he owns. You go back to the place that was your inheritance, is your place. It's very similar to the idea of making return of Shuvah, of coming back to the Lord, of coming back to the starting point. You know, in sports, they'll talk about uh, the, the batter gets into a batting slump and he's not hitting the ball like he did before. And what do they always tell them? Go back to basics. Go back to the foundations. Go back and make sure that you're not becoming sloppy in the way that you're approaching it. And usually the simplicity of the basics is what brings a person back to their proper form again. We get lazy. We get sloppy. And in our spiritual life, that happens as well. He says this in verse 14 of Vayakra, Leviticus 25. If you sell anything to your neighbor or buy anything from him, neither of you is to exploit the other. Now, I want to mention this because... These are elements that are a part of being in conflict with our human nature. The only reference that we can find in the scripture to where the Yovel was actually attempted to be implemented was during a time when I believe it was Jeremiah had mentioned to the people to return people back to their lands again. And all of that. And they said, yes, we will do it. And they did it. And then they looked at the bottom line and said, you know what? I don't want to do that. And they took it back again. So it never really even took hold. But there is something about the way a community is supposed to work together, how it's supposed to function as a community. We talked a couple weeks ago about to love your neighbor as yourself and what is a neighbor and how it's not just the person who lives next door to you, but it's the getting to know and intimacy that is developed in that relationship so that we can speak frankly to one another because we have permission by way of relationship that we have with those people. And so there is something about that is if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy anything from him, neither of you is to exploit the other. So it's kind of interesting because that sounds alien in some ways for people's ears because everybody says, hey, it's a doggy dog world. You get what you got to get out of it and you do what it takes to do and get ahead and don't worry about anybody else. Make sure you get yours. And there is something about, even if you don't feel that way, there is something about the selfishness that develops in the community as people begin to acquire material things and wealth. And so he spells out some of these things. It's interesting, too, that uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but a little bit further down, it says in verse 29, a little different element here. He says, if someone sells a dwelling in a walled city, he has one year after the date of sale in which to redeem it. For a full year, he will have the right of redemption. But if he has not redeemed the dwelling in the walled city within the year, 
then title is perpetually passed to the buyer through all his generations. It will not revert in the Yovel. However, houses and villages not surrounded by walls are to be dealt with like the fields in the countryside. They may be redeemed before the Yovel, and they revert in the Yovel. Now, why is that happening? Because in one sense, there are no crops that you build <laughs> in a walled city dwelling. It's sort of like an apartment building complex, sort of like a condominium, I guess, if you will, since you own it. And yet it has these different stipulations. Person decides, you know, I, I had to do this, but I can afford to get it back again. They say, I'm sorry, I need a big increase over it. Inflation and everything has happened. I want 20% more. He says, you don't exploit one another. There are these stipulations that are there. And what they are setting in place Instead of, I'm not going to go into the whole thing. It says in another place, verse 36, uh, he says, do not charge him interest or otherwise profit from it, but fear your God so that your brother can continue living with you. Do not take interest when you loan him money and take or take a profit when you sell him food. And then verse 39 if a member of your people has become poor among you and sells himself to you, do not make him do the work of a slave. Rather, you are to treat him like an employee or a tenant. He will work for you until the year of Yovel. Do not treat, verse 43, do not treat him harshly, but fear your God. And there's just something very special about it. He, it, the, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with it, but the, it, 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 there is something about the way that God wants us to function. If we don't function that way, we end up moving into a dystopia. Now, I was pretty amazed. I thought about this because normally if we think of a dystopia, you think of 1984, you think of Brave New World, you think of the Terminator, the Matrix. Uh, there was one with Matt Damon called Elysium, where they had the elites could go and be healed up in the upper atmosphere, and everybody on the ground was terrifying. The, the, the picture that I have here are these buildings falling apart. And in every movie that you see that talks about a deterioration of society, whether it's Mad Max or whatever it may be. I mean, when you think about it, there are innumerable, it's amazing how many movies there are that actually deal with those things. Uh, I Am Legend, Maze Runner, Hunger Games, Water World, Book of Eli. I mean, you can go on and on. There's no limit to these things. Hotel Rwanda. In all of these things, you see the deterioration of the human heart towards one another. You see them moving not only to not loving their neighbor as themselves, but moving towards trying to figure out how they can gain the system, how they can make a profit at the destruction of others. It doesn't come into play. Don't even think about it. There's other things that have happened. If you think about this, I, I thought, you know, a lot of times people say, well, Revelation and Matthew 24, and it's for the last days, and it's in the last days. And I'm thinking to myself recently as I thought about it, the last days. Well, it said back in the time of the apostles that we were already in the last days. We've been in the last days for over 2,000 years. And there is something also that's important to look at. It isn't just some time in the future. And all of these dystopian messages that come out. And I mentioned this too because uh, Neil brought up to me something that I, I didn't realize. You know the, the movie Soylent Green? Actually, you know what year it said that that was taking place? 2022. <laughs> people were starving. People were hungry. And all of these things, social issues, dissolve, people fight each other, people steal from each other, all of the things that he says here not to do, restore back again. And they don't restore, they just destroy one another. 
And one of the things that's kind of interesting with Soylent Green, uh, I, I thought maybe with all the stuff going on, we're looking at food shortages, we're looking at all the things that people, it's amazing. You can get people be friendly to each other, but let them become hungry, let them not have food, and it takes a very short period of time before people are ready to kill one another to get what they have. But here's the thing about it. Dystopian systems are not just somewhere in the future, as if it's some science fiction novel. But there is something that you can see the handwriting on the wall throughout all of human history. I mean, when you think about it, they talk in terms of utopia, but it's always a dystopia. A utopia is where everything is shared, everybody has, everybody's doing great, everybody's happy. But really what ends up happening is they pull the people of power out of power and they put themselves in that place of power and that new place of elitism takes on different characters. But they are still in a position of wanting to maintain control over other human beings. And when you look at it, all through history, we can see these totalitarian institutions raised up. We see the destruction that happens. There is no real consideration of life, but people are disposable. People can be canceled. And it seems that it doesn't stop with just speech cancellation. It seems to gravitate each time these things happen to actual human life being canceled. It partially comes from a false understanding of what life represents. And when we minimize life, it's not a, it's not a long step to take to minimizing other lives. If we can abort millions of children and not think about it as really anything, then maybe Soylent Green comes in, if you know the story. They had these little food things that kept people fed. And every time a person would come, become an older and past a certain point, they would go to a place where they would see these images and all of that. And basically, they were dying. And whether they thought they were dying or not, they were dying. And what you didn't know until the end of the movie, it ruined it for you, is that these food sources that they were using, the Soylent Green, was made up of the protein of all of those older people that were killed. And it was for the well-being of the world, right? Everybody was young. All of it sounded good till you start to get to those days. Did you ever see the movie? I, I mentioned a couple movies here. Did you ever see the movie Time Machine? You know, where he's in his study and he, wants, he goes forward and forward and he comes to a place, everything is beautiful and everything is wonderful. And then he finds that it's still there. He figures war is now over. People have been destroyed. They now are starting back. And he finds this, this idyllic kind of a place with all young people. And then they find out, he finds out that there are those who are underground who basically are lords over all those people. And basically what they were doing once again was keeping the young people as their eventual food supply. And they would all go and follow the gong and follow the thing and go into their ritual religious experience. And you didn't hear from them again. And it's amazing to me as I thought about this, it's amazing how the scriptures speak about all of these things, the deterioration of community, the deterioration of the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood, we say. But there is something about the way we treat one another. And when we look at it, think about some of these things. In the 20th century, we had over a million, I'm sorry, over 100 million people slaughtered we talk about six million Jews being killed during the Holocaust. 
But during the 20th century, we've had over 100 million people. About half of them were destroyed by famine and genocide. When you look at all of these different things, and I've mentioned this before, in the movie Hotel Rwanda, there was that situation where the Houthi were ethnically cleansing themselves of the Tutsi minority. And there was a point where one man who was Houthi and the other was Houthi but married to a Tutsi. <laughs> that sounds funny, but that's what it was. He starts looking and he's thinking, oh, the slaughter of these children. This is horrible. And as he's relating it, the other one is thinking in terms of a whole different mindset. And he says, yes, isn't it wonderful? If we kill all the children, our enemy will be gone. And the other man is sick over what he's seeing happen. People destroying. They're not people anymore. Remember, that was one of the things that Hitler did. He said, they're not humans, Jews. It's okay. And he used religious writings. He used Luther, who said that Jews were not people. They were animals. And a crazed leader like Hitler came along and used those things to forward his own ambitions, his own plans. But, you know, there were others also when you look at things like the communists in the Soviet Union, when you look at communist China, when you look at the killing fields, when you look at all over and over again, millions of people slaughtered. You know, when Mao Zedong came into power, his idea was to reduce, for agricultural purposes, the population. His intention was to destroy 50 million peasants because who needs that many peasants? When you look at the scope of what has taken place, it comes down to, I said, cure for dystopia. We're going to look at that in a moment because there is a cure that's there. There's an antidote. There's a vaccine against drifting into a dystopian place, into a nightmare. I mean, you look at all of the ones. There's never any enough gas. They can't have water. They have no food. All the different things that go on. They barter. All the stuff that happens in all of these stories. The matrix. Everybody's living in another level. They're, they're, they're tuned out to what the reality is. And the reality was very dark. And all of them are like these buildings, partially falling apart, deteriorating, always very dark. But here's the one thing to look at. I want to bring up, I'm getting a little carried away on some of this. Let me, let me come over here to something in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, in the Haftorah portion, 32, it talks about God speaking to Yeremiahu, Jeremiah, and saying, I want you to take your uncle's place, Hanamael, and I want you to buy his property, buy his field. You have next of kin rights to redeem it, so buy it. Now, what's interesting is they were going into captivity. It was not a great deal. Going into captivity, nobody was going to be on the property at that point. And God instructs Jeremiah to go in and buy his uncle's field. He has the right, first right of redemption. And what God was trying to show was that in doing this contract and making this purchase, he was saying as dystopic as it was then, as tyrannical and totalitarian as it was with being brought into captivity and all the stuff happening, losing everything you have, not having food, not having those things, God was going to bring restoration again. And he says to Jeremiah, buy the field. Jeremiah never came back to use the field. But his descendants probably did. There is a future that God wants us to see. The future is not 
dark. What we pass through is a dark place oftentimes that is the result of our drifting away from the Lord, drifting away from what he has called us to do and be, where we minimize the neighbor, where we minimize one another, where we distance ourselves and isolate ourselves in such ways that we form groups and don't allow anybody from outside to come into the group. We isolate ourselves and we find ourselves very, using words, I, was, I thought it was interesting that there was a point with the Chinese famine that was there, the Great Famine. They called it the three years of economic difficulty. That's what the government called it. Three years of economic difficulty. And he said this. It said, Mao and other leaders did not have the requisite experience in socialist construction to achieve their goals under these difficult conditions but chose to pursue their excessive targets due to overconfidence and smugness following their past successes. So they looked at what they had thought was considered success, and it was blurred in reality because they wanted a certain outcome. And the outcome is never for the purpose, really, of the people. They say, this is going to be a utopia. It'll be great. You know who it's a utopia for? Dystopia systems promise a utopia, but can never actually deliver on their promise. Because the goal is really to maintain complete control over the people. That's the whole purpose. And that's why in all of these different systems, there is a dehumanization of people to where everyone is going around with a cloud. Everyone is in darkness. Everything's deteriorated. Everything is broken down. And all of these images that we see are like that. Broken down images. It's interesting, too, that there is a place where he says in Leviticus 25, 23, he says, you are only foreigners and temporary residents. You know, we talk about who are citizens. And yet when it comes to the things of God, God was saying that the land you're going into is my land. I'm letting you have it. But if you do not treat the land like it's supposed to be treated, you also will be spewed out of the land. If you move towards controls, if you move towards trying to own it yourself, you'll be out and the land will rest and other descendants will come along and cultivate it properly. The ultimate was the time when we saw what happened with the destruction of Jerusalem around 2000 years in 70. When that happened, not one stone left upon another. They burnt to the ground even though the cry was, the decree was, do not destroy the buildings. They wanted to use them for Zeus. They wanted to use them for their own religious cult groups. Only when they came in, they saw the depravity of what happened to the people in the city. Under siege, God brought deliverance out of a very dark place. And one of the things that you saw was uh, Josephus described what took place in the siege. What made it to be the single most destructive event of all history? You say, oh, but look at the Holocaust, six million. Look at all these wars. What made it uniquely different is not what outside forces did to a people. Those kind of atrocities happen all the time through history, and it doesn't mean that it should happen. It's terrible. But what happened in Jerusalem was the result of being under siege, what the people did to each other. They came into cannibalism. They came into stealing from one another. They came into minimizing each other. They came into factions and fighting and destruction. And when the Romans, with their hearty Roman discipline came in, they were so overwhelmed by the degrading of the people among themselves that they said, just burn it, just burn it. They didn't even want to deal with it. And that's when it was destroyed. 
And then you see, for all of these years, our people carried that dystopic mindset. Seemed like everywhere we went, our people were once again put off into the dark places, put off into the ghettos, put off into that. You look at other people, you look at slavery, you look at the African nation, you look at the kind of things when people degrade other human beings, when they take them. You know, it's funny when they talk about how wonderful it was here with the Native Americans. But the history of the Native Americans in North America was one of slavery and brutality between the different tribes. It wasn't all kumbaya. And in fact, when they talk about Columbus, I get sidetracked for a second here, they talk about Columbus coming in and wanting to enslave the people. The fact was that when they first came, he first came in, it wasn't up in North America either, it was in the islands down there. And what he did was, they asked if they would assist them in getting their people back who had been taken into slavery. And he assisted them in that process. He was not making them slaves. But slavery already existed throughout the world. Every group has a way of having someone they want to control. And we see this over and over again through history. You know, it's funny, too. You remember, remember the movie Future World? Where you had the robots that you, 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 you had your entertainment, and then somewhere along the way, the robots got out of control. They started to think for themselves. And what was the guy's name, the one who was in The King and I? Yul Brenner. Yul Brenner was the cowboy, and all of a sudden, he was going berserk, right? He's killing everybody. That's not supposed to happen. These are real bullets. What's going on here? <laughs> well, the best laid plans... Don't always work out. Remember the images back in Back to the Future 2 when they went back to the alternate reality of what happened, right? It was a totally dystopic system. Everything geared around starting with the success of all of the gambling that Biff did and built the empire and everyone was against everybody. Everybody was fighting. Everybody was shooting. The principal was firing the guns. School hadn't been in existence for years. I mean, you look at the deterioration of all these things. And I started to wonder, why is it that so many movies speak of Hunger Games? I mean, look at how the elite were dressed amazingly. And it was entertainment for them. Look at the Romans when they would watch in the Colosseum as Christians were fed to the lions or people, gladiators, were fighting. They did not care about who lived or died. It was a game. They said up or down, and then boom, they would kill them. No mercy. There was no sense of the value of life. And whether you believe in the issues of abortion or not, one thing is very clear. It deteriorates the concept of the value of life. It's interesting that in the Bible, one of the things that it mentions is the shedding of innocent blood. The shedding of innocent blood. And in the process of shedding innocent blood, all of the sense of care for others disappears. Everything becomes selfish. Everything becomes a problem. You know, one of the things that we see also is that the children are constantly the ones who are being destroyed by these concepts. And I mentioned this before, but uh, Vladimir Lenin made this statement, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. Have you ever wondered why some of these things going on in the schools, why they want to bring sexual education, sexual types, talking about different things that you can be, talking about this to five, six, seven, eight-year-olds. Because if they can take over their mindset, if they can control them for about four years, according to the fearless leader, Vladimir Stalin, he will embed within them 
concepts that cannot be uprooted. Everybody begins to tell on one another. Everybody begins to turn each other in. There's something sad. We talk about all of the viewing, you know, when you saw, it was amazing when you think about 1984, how he describes a two-way TV. I mean, they hardly had TV yet, right? And he's talking about two-way. Big Brother can watch you. Big Brother is watching. <laughs> but there was this hopelessness that is accompanying all of these different images. People are not liberated by totalitarian governments. They're not liberated by everybody sharing together. A few are benefited, and they're the ones who control everybody else. Now, I mention this because look at other places. Look in the book of Revelation. It's amazing when you look at throughout the scripture how much time, I didn't even notice it quite this way, how much time is described in the scriptures of the dystopian breakdown of society that happens, and it happens so often, and that's why one of the main messages that God says throughout is, Shuva, return, come back to me. He says, when you go into there and you've done all these things, when we've gone into and we're dispersed, Solomon said, when the temple is destroyed and, and people are scattered because of our sins, if we look to this place, will you remember us? What a time to have a prayer like that when you're dedicating the temple. And yet he's saying when we, it doesn't say if we ever go astray. He says when we go astray and serve other gods and are dispersed throughout the world, if we look to this place, and that's where that verse comes back. It's God's answer to his prayer. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. It's constantly an ebb and flow of darkness and light. Darkness and light. Moving away and drawing near. God is constantly calling us back to return. Here again, listen to this. What is it about children? In Jeremiah 32, he says in 35, and they built the high places of Baal, which are in ben Hinnom, in the valley, to burn alive their sons and daughters to Malak, something I did not order them to do. It never even entered my mind that they would do such an abominable thing. And thus, they caused Yehuda to sin. Now, what is that saying? They offered, and if you look into the history of it, I wrote something down here. It says, in these verses, as these verses are repeated, it says two important variations, Baal and Malak. But what they're referring to is the same thing, the sun god. Malach and Baal are similar, but with different names. Uh, it says, Malach is the sun as the mighty fire, which in passing through the signs of the zodiac burns up its own children. It is an old Canaanite worship carried by the Phoenicians to all their colonies and firmly established in Palestine at the time when the Israelites conquered the country. He was telling him, and here, this is the part that's so amazing. You have a God who destroys Egypt. You have a God who comes in and opens up this vast new land and says, these people have destroyed everything. You're going to come in and it's going to be yours. But if you do what they did, you'll also be spit out of the land. And you think, wow, what possessed them to say, I wonder how they did this. What was it they actually did with Moloch? And eventually be sacrificing their own sons and daughters to the fire god, to the sun god. Amazing. But this is the deterioration of what happens when we don't follow through with what God says to do. 
we become subject to other voices, other places, other thoughts, other things. And I want to just look at a couple of other things here. Uh, you know, in Jeremiah 31, he says this, the covenant I will make with him after those days, not according to the covenant that they broke, though I was a husband to them when I brought them out of Egypt. Here the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, verse 30 of Jeremiah 31. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them, says Hashem. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Hashem. I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or his brother, no Hashem, for all will know me from the least of them to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. In the midst of all of these tumultuous times, he says these things a little bit earlier. He said here, here in verse 26, at that time, verse 27, just as I used to watch over them with the intent to uproot, break down, overthrow, destroy and do harm. So then I will watch over them to build and plant, says the Lord. When those days come, they will no longer say the father has eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. He's saying each one will be responsible for his himself and for his sins. But there is this idea that we do things that drift us away from him and the darkness and the destruction and deterioration of the world around us is influenced by that. And you say, wow, that's pretty dark, Rabbi. Say something happy. I got to say this. It's insidious. It seems to carry not off to some future event that's going to happen. But it happens and has been happening for millennia. It's been happening all along. It's not just some future world that will be this deterioration and stuff. Look at what happened with the Tower of Babel back in Bereshit in Genesis. They were doing it then. They said, we can build a tower to God. They wanted him out of the picture. They were going to be in charge. They were dispersed. It, there is something that happens, and with it, as destructive and as rapidly as things can deteriorate, God has a way of bringing about transformation. Look for a moment at Luke 4. He's describing when he came out of the wilderness, he goes into a synagogue, as was his custom. He returned to the Galil, the Galilee, in the power of the Spirit, verse 14, and reports about him spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone respected him. Verse 16, now when he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up on Shabbat. He went to the synagogue as usually, stood up to read, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of Hashem is upon me because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the imprisoned, renewed sight to the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of favor of Hashem. After closing the scroll and returning to the, to the Shamash, he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak to them. Today, as you heard it read, this passage of the Tanakh was fulfilled. Everyone was speaking well of him and marveling that such appealing words were coming from his mouth. They were even asking, can this be Yosef's son? Then Yeshua said, no doubt you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And he describes this, that even in his own town, his hometown, they could not get past what they knew of his family. And so he couldn't do a lot of the kind of miracles that he was doing everywhere else. Sometimes we can become so familiar with things that we diminish the power of God. And 
it's fascinating when you look in Galatians 6. He tells them this. And I find it amazing. I mentioned this the last few weeks. It's always amazing to me how much time the emissaries of Messiah spent writing to believers to not follow their old nature. <laughs> I mean, it, you say, well, they're believers. They don't have an old nature anymore, right? Yeah, right. That darkness comes so quickly. And God's light can also come that quickly. He says, don't delude yourselves, Galatians 6, 7. No one makes a fool of God. A person reaps what he sows. Those who keep sowing to the field of their old nature in order to meet its demands will eventually reap ruin. But those who keep sowing in the field of the Spirit will reap from the Spirit everlasting life. So let us not grow weary in doing what is good, for if we don't give up, we will in due time reap the harvest. Therefore, as the opportunity arises, let us do what is good to everyone, especially to the family of those who are trusting. You know, I mentioned one other movie, and I saw it the other day. I haven't seen it for a long time. And you'd say, well, that's not a dystopian movie, but it's an old movie from 1941 with Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck. Meet John Doe. Remember that movie? It's on the Turner classic movies every now and then, but it's this old movie, and it was a guy who was hired, he's a baseball player, hired to do a promotion, saying he's going to jump and commit suicide because the world is so bad. And as things progress, Everybody say, no, don't kill yourself. And then at one point, the girl, Barbara Stanwyck in this, um, writes a speech for him. And he doesn't read it. He just gets up and reads the speech and speaks of neighbors and people working together and observing those around you. I, I was watching because I thought, gee, we were just talking about this. And what happens is a movement happens where it's like the John Doe groups begin to happen. They call them John Doe because that's what they referred to him as. Every man, every John Doe. And it was a movement that was happening with thousands of little group organizations all over the country. And in the process of this, you say, well, that doesn't sound dystopian. But in the process of it, the guy sponsoring it, the newspaper guy sponsoring it, he had quietly ulterior motives. And they had a meeting with people coming from all over the country of all the people from the groups. And they stood there at the convention. In the meantime, he found out that this newspaper guy was going to have in the speech that he was going to give Gary Cooper. <laughs> He was going to say, we need to form a political movement and we need to take this man and make him our candidate for president. He wanted control. And when he walks into the room where they were all talking about it, all of these political people, well, I want a part of it too and I want a part of it also. And they were the same dystopian mindset there of controlling the people, using this grassroots movement. And here's what happens also. It's not enough if they can't get what they want in their greed, they'll destroy everything. So as wonderful as this movement was, he was coming in there to tell the people, it's never been political and we're not going to be political. And he was going to say that, you know, he was going to confess that he had lied about who he was and all of this. And the other guy comes in, the police, everything he controls, and they start yelling, he's a fraud, he's a fraud. They had a paper that came out and all of this. And in a moment, all of these thousands of people in the Coliseum started throwing the paper, throwing tomatoes at Gary Cooper because he was a fraud. Only they didn't understand the whole story, the rest of the story. And he was present, the newspaper guy was presenting himself as the, as the 
guy above it all. He was really for the people. And he was horrified to find out that this man was deceptive. And then in the end, he was going to go and do what he said earlier. He was going to jump off the building at Christmas Eve. And then the girl he loved came and all this other stuff. And people who said, look, we're sorry what we did. The message you had, people were caring for their neighbors. People were working together. It was happening all over the country. People were given jobs, all this stuff. And in a moment, that darkness came over. And it may not seem like a dystopian mindset, but it was the same mindset. Wanting control of the people and wanting to bring darkness doesn't matter what destructive measures are there. They're going to get what they want. And I'll tell you, in some ways, we see these things repeating over and over again, too, don't we? No baby formula, no gas. And you say, well, how could they be so dumb? They're not dumb. They keep saying it's all working out fine. And you say, working out fine, it's terrible. Look at what's happening. There's not anything anywhere. It's working out fine because that's what they want. The, what they wanted, and they say it very clearly in the politicians, they want to have the gas prices as high or higher than Europe. They want to have food shortages. They want people to be dependent on the nation, on the leaders, on the elite. And they are selling people down the road. It's disgusting. But this happens over and over again. And I'm not talking political. The one thing I loved about that movie, Meet John Doe, <laughs> was that they made this movement happen and none of it was political until they had the people gathered and they were getting ready to shift it all to political. And we have to watch out the cure is to allow the Spirit of God to work in us, that we don't get sidetracked by other things. Don't let others define life for us. Do what God says to do, and we'll begin to see God do things beyond what we can ask, think, or imagine. You know, when you look at that other passage, he says, you reap what you sow. This is so true. He says, therefore, as the opportunity arrives, let us do what is good to everyone, especially to the family of those who are trustingly faithful. And then Corinthians. Okay, he says to them, having to do with slavery, he says, were, were you a slave when you were called? Well, don't let it bother you. Although, if you can gain freedom, your freedom, take advantage of the opportunity. For a person who was a slave when he was called, is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, someone who was a free man when he was called is a slave of the Messiah. Now, this is so important. Listen to the verse, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 7. You were bought at a price, so do not become slaves of other human beings. Let each one remain with God in the condition in which he was called. Now, he, people have wondered and questioned, you know, if you're a slave, remain a slave. Slavery has been with us for thousands of years. Since human beings came into existence, they were enslaving one another. This was not some new phenomena that took place when they discovered America. This is something that has gone on and still goes on today, where people are using slave labor where women are being used, and men and boys used as sex trafficking slaves. And all of this is going on. And because we don't see it, we're focusing on what we see around us. We're focusing on the position. It's like that newspaper guy who was saying, here's what it says. Look at this. It's terrible. And they say, yeah, it's terrible. And they follow along, and they devalue what their own experience understood, caring for one another, working together. And they were ready to throw him under the bus. Amazing. When we think about it, the power that we have, if we will 
take advantage of this. You were bought at a price. It wasn't a cheap price. It was an expensive price. Do not become slaves of other human beings. When I think of that, not just in terms of, you know, get me the water, do this, that kind of slavery, but slaves by allowing other people to manipulate and control us, how we think, how we speak, what we do, all of this, all of those things to keep us under control. Eventually, it looks like all those dark movies. It's dark, it's dingy, everything's broken, nothing works, no fuel, no water, no food, fighting everybody for just a little something. Unbelievable. But this is the deterioration of the human condition, and it's why God sent us. You know, I wonder, I mentioned Soylent Green. I wonder if you could call that, since it happens to be the year that they were doing it. And I'm thinking to myself, I thought, maybe this is kind of crazy, okay? So I, allow me a little bit of crazy. I thought maybe we could have called it the Soylent Green New Deal. Everything had to do, if you look at it, in all of these dystopian things, there's no breathing in the atmosphere. There is pollution everywhere. There's destruction, all of this. And it's all calculated by people who are in charge. And so I don't know when people say, well, everything is moving along great. Yeah, if your purpose is to bring about the fall and destruction of the nation, it's working out great. If they won't buy electric cars, let's keep boosting the cost of gasoline to where people are saying in the news, well, I don't think I'm going to be driving much anymore. That's exactly what they want. And I'm not talking politics here. I'm saying we need to be above all that. We need to hear the voice of God. We need to go to the word of God. We need to allow the one who paid such a price, bought at a price. You could say it was inflation. I mean, he, what the price he paid, you'd think was more than needed, and yet he paid a price because he understood the deterioration of the human mindset and how susceptible we are to all those powers of darkness, and he wants to set us free. That is the secret behind it. God, with all the things we can see around us, you know, when you see all of these things, we will look and say, oh, it's so bad, it's so bad, wringing of our hands, all these other things going on. But in reality, God is saying it's never ending. That's not your destination. The goal is beyond that. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God and Messiah Yeshua. Press towards the place where God can move with power in our lives. These are the things, the cure for a dystopian mindset is to clear our mind of all of those things and look at what God's word says. Look at how he says to deal with our neighbors. Look how it says to, how he says to treat one another. Look how he, how he says, and not just look at what he says and voice what he says, but do what he says. What happens is there is the antidote for all of these other things because if they cannot conquer it by manipulation, they move towards violence. If they can't break you in that violence... Someone somewhere along the way is going to be redeemed by the power of God's spirit being evidently set forth in how he works in us. And there may be perilous times, but we serve a God who is calling us to return and to bring about transformation and to rebuild the old ruins. We read that also, to build up the ruined cities. The one who said, You've run off in so many different directions. But then he says, at that time, it was in Jeremiah where he said, at that time, just as I used to watch over them with the intent of uprooting, breakdown, overthrowing, destroying, and doing harm because they had strayed away so desperately. So then I will watch over them to build and plant, says the Lord. This is what God wants to do, to build and to plant. And I don't know why it is 
that we have to always seem to go to the lowest place before we see the light. But it amazes me over and over again how many times people say, and then I lost it all. And that's when I found the Lord. <laughs> Why? Why didn't you do it when you had something? Because whatever it is, we still think we can do it in our own strength. And that's the wickedness. It isn't just the wicked deeds that people do. It's the fact that we put ourselves as more important than God and put our own thoughts ahead of his. Lord, we thank you for these passages and sort of a history and movie lesson here. But Lord, our children are under attack. They're seeking to take and rob them of something, rob them of innocence, playing with dolls, playing with toys, learning to read all these things. These things are lost under a onslaught, an avalanche of things that children not only don't understand, but there is no reason to bring these kinds of things except if you want to control them from early on. And if that's the case, Lord, we ask you to remove those ruthless minds and goals that people have. And Lenin said, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. Lord, we need to sow seed into our children that will never be uprooted. But the seed of your word, the seed of faith, the seed of your love, the seed of community, the seed of loving our neighbors, the seed of your spirit bringing about transformation over all the places of darkness, letting your light shine in such a way that it's like noonday in the midst of the night, that you would give us the boldness to go forward, to go into battle by the power of your spirit to bring victory and set the captives free. Lord, we call upon you. We're not looking to be superheroes coming along, have Judge Dredd or some of these other characters that come along. The guy from The Matrix, Keanu Reeves. We're not looking for superheroes. We're looking for people to stand in the gap and do what you said to do, Lord. Help us to follow through in your word, to draw near to you, to draw near to one another, to look over the welfare of one another. What are the needs that each one has? What are the things that they're going through? Where can we step in and bring comfort and peace and assurance and come alongside one another? Lord, these are the things that you established when Yeshua said, my kingdom is not of this world. You're a king? My kingdom is not of this world, he said. The kingdom that we serve, we are like aliens and residents in your possession, Lord, in your land. And what makes the value of it is as we yield ourselves to you. Lord, open up our hearts, not only to walk in union with you, but with one another. To look at people without being weary of where they're coming from, what they mean, and what was their ulterior motive, and what was... But to look and say, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Hope's fadeless under all circumstances. Lord, we call upon you to open up the love that you said is our gift from you. And we ask you to make a transformation in our region one person at a time. As we reach out to our neighbors and reach out to people around us. And see you do exploits in our midst, oh God. It's not a political movement. It's not a religious movement. It's a people and God movement. And we ask, oh God, that we will draw near to you and draw near to one another. And let your love permeate every heart. And set the captives free. Let the chains fall off. And the brutality that people suffer be relieved by your presence and by your power and by your word and by the sacrifice Messiah made for each one, the price, the very steep price that was paid 
so that we could be free. Help us to walk in that freedom without compromise. In Yeshua's name. Amen. As Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Everyone agree by saying amen and amen. Greet one another. You know, I heard something the other day. I just want to say this. I heard something the other day in the news that, that really startled me. They mentioned that the person who leaked the information about the justices' decision. And the commentator said that if they could find out who it was that did it, she would have sex with him. And if she got pregnant, she would gladly abort that thing. There was somebody else who said, the formula shortage? Well, you chose to bring him into this world. If you aborted him, you wouldn't have that problem. So they found a way to deal with the shortage. Kill the kids. I mean, that's dark. I don't mean to end on that. God wants us to bring light, and to bring healing, and to bring nurturing from him. So, but I, I meant to mention that a little bit, and I just threw that in for free at the end. But I mean, we're dealing with something that's real, you know what I mean? We have to stand strong in the Lord. And we'll see you in shul. Invite people to come out. God bless you. Shabbat shalom.